morning. Today's scripture is from Acts 1, 1 to 11, in the NLT. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. I told you before, John baptized with water, but, just, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? <clears throat> he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you, are, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling, pe pe telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, <coughs> he was taken up into the cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Thank you, Ed. Last fall, when I went to Toronto to, or Mississauga to the Canadian Baptist Ministries board meetings, they surprised us. It wasn't on the agenda, or at least I didn't get that agenda. There was a lawyer there. He was a lawyer from Halifax, and he was a human resources lawyer and a, a, a governance lawyer. That means how you run your thing, your built your your organization, and. He had been asked by the, the general secretary, executive secretary of, of CBM, to come and to, to tell the board how they're doing and how they're doing in terms of being an organization. And he came and he just, it was miserable. He said things that about, I've been involved with CBM for many years and Linda and I first went from Nova Scotia, we were in Nova Scotia and we flew to Toronto and they, we went to an orientation all about CBM and what they were doing. And, they said, do anybody want to be a missionary? And Linda and I said, yes. That was way back in 78. And we've been involved, and I think that they're pretty good. This lawyer did not. Well, he actually said it was pretty good, but he, he, he mentioned a few things. He, and the way, language they use when they talk about how you do things, it, it's an easy word. The word ends. Like E-N-D-S, that's where you want to end up if you're an organization. And you're supposed to figure out, and your ends are supposed to be really, really easy to explain to somebody, and mostly to keep your staff in line. If you're a board, you, you put your, make your ends very clear so that when you hire staff, and, uh, and missionaries are staff, and all those people, they all fall within the parameters of those ends. And that lawyer, he said that your, the CBM's ends, and so he said last fall, were so big that you could drive a truck through them. The, the, the staff could do whatever they wanted all around the world, and they could start new missions in one place and another and another place. They could, all kinds of things. And he said, you gotta fix that. So the board members are from all across Canada. There's three from Western Canada and Ontario and three from, and that kind of thing. And, and we started at it last fall and realized, we can't do that, we need to fix this up. It's been a lot of years. And this man, this lawyer is saying, we've got to fix it. Now he said, don't blow it all up and start like heart surgery. It's just a finger surgery kind of thing. So we kept reminding ourselves, and I'm not going to tell you any more than this. I'm just setting this up because when we started, we, this last weekend, we, that was the task. And they actually did the business that we usually do in about one morning and the rest of the time we moved over, changed places and had put into a room and we worked. 
and we worked hard at, at in a sense, distilling down what it is that we want to do. And you know, people kept standing up and saying, well, it's all about Jesus. Well, that's true. And that's really what we... We didn't change much, we just focused it a little bit more. And I was really pleased that our Canadian Baptist Ministries would go through that kind of exercise and come up with the, the answer that we all knew in the first place. Every kid that comes up here and, know, and gets que asked a question at, at children's time, at kids' time, knows that probably the answer is going to be Jesus, right? <laughs> and when I ask questions at, in my sermons, yeah, just stick with that one. You'll, you'll do fine. Because it is all about Jesus. And when we think about our relationship, no, our reason for being here, you woke up this morning, whether you had uh, sore bones like Larry or you were just... Uh, taking the right pills and you don't have any sore, pill, uh, sore bones or something. But our, what's our reason for being? And we need to connect who we are and what we're doing with some truth, with some reality. For me, as a follower of Jesus, there's an old song that just the kids maybe don't sing it enough anymore, but you sing it when you, somebody might ask you, what is it that keeps you close to God? Well, for me, it's remembering that Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus, the Son of God, creator of heaven and earth, he loves me. And so we sing, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And how do we know? Because the Bible tells me so. Now, isn't that a simple sermon you ever heard? That's it's amazing. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. And the CBM worked on their end statement. They came up with that, pretty near that too, that the world needs to hear Jesus. And this passage of scripture that we're looking at this morning is the beginning of the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is a wonderful story. And it's a, a continuation, Luke, stories of Jesus, part two. That's what we're looking at. It's not just a, a sequel. It's the same story. Jesus isn't in it in terms of walking around very much other than these verses that we read this morning, but he's in almost every verse, all the way through the stories as the followers of Jesus got a hold of what they were supposed to look like and what they were supposed to do. And for us, we need to know that. What we need to look at what they how they did it and the beginnings of it. So because they were to bridge from the gospel of the good news of Jesus to the world, and that's what we're supposed to do. I'd like to read a quote, and I think I need it up there because I don't have it here. Um, it's the first uh, slide there. It's a quote from a, you know, the next slide down in the, uh, after the message part. There we go. J.B. Phillips wrote a, a modern version of the Bible and I know it was a long time ago because my dad was really excited about when he was a pastor in the 60s. So this is what J.B. Phillips wrote in the preface to his commentary or his translation of the book of Acts. And I can read it better here. He said, that one, uh, he says, that one cannot spend several months in close study of this book, that's the book of Acts that we're looking at, without being profoundly stirred, and to be honest, disturbed. The reader is stirred, he says, because he has seen Christianity, the real thing, in action for the first time in human history. Here we are seeing the church in its first youth, valiant and unspoiled. A body of ordinary men and women joined in an unconquerable fellowship, never before seen on this earth. But the reader is also disturbed. And we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. And if you're not disturbed, we'll tell me about it, and I'll try to get that part through to you. <laughs> the reader is also disturbed. For surely, J.B. Phillips adds, this is the church as it was meant to be. It is vigorous and flexible, for these are the days before it ever became huh, fat and short of breath through prosperity, or muscle-bound over 
by over-organization. These men did not make acts of faith they believed. They did not say their prayers. They really prayed. They did not hold conferences on psychosomatic medicine. They simply healed the sick. <laughs> you almost want to get reading the book he's talking about, don't you? And we're going to. We're going to look at it. Because it was written by uh, uh, Luke, a medical doctor who was a friend of the Apostle Paul. And through the Apostle Paul and through maybe through the other disciples that he may have interviewed, we don't know, he wrote the story. And the story is exciting. It's an amazing story. And so it's worth the effort to reclaim the excitement of the book of Acts. Because we don't want to be fat and short of breath. Because we have so much. Even so much, story, so much about the Bible and all the rest of it. Or muscle bound by having to or organized the way um, J.B. Phillips put it. So now we're going to look at the rest of the story. In verses 1 and 3, 1 to 3, we hear further instructions from Jesus. It, and mostly it proved that he was alive. He says, as I told you in my first book, about everything Jesus did and, and taught, then he continued to give instructions. And he says, during the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of heaven. So our purpose in looking at the book of Acts, we need to know more about the kingdom. We need to know it in such a way that it's been proven to us. We're not in doubt that Jesus is alive. We're not in doubt that he, his kingdom is here among us. We need to learn about the kingdom. We need to check out our doubts. We need to interact with the living Jesus. And that's our opportunity. As mind-boggling as that is, when you try to tell somebody why you go to church, and if you answer them, I go to church so that I'm with brothers and sisters who are also interacting with the living Christ every day. They may be just as incredulous about that as the bones and stuff. Maybe you're having a vision. But do you have any doubts about Jesus as the living Christ now in, available to you to live and walk with and talk with? Well, of course you do. But as we look at the book of Acts, remember that Jesus was teaching his disciples in those 40 days, as he had done all the three years before, that this, he was alive. But especially after his death, they had seen him die. They had seen him carried away to burial. And now they knew he was alive. And Luke just touches on that in those few verses. And then he goes on. He says, in verse 4, he says, Once, when he was eating with them. This is in the 40 days. And, and maybe you're okay with this. And, and it, you just let it slip by. Of course, if he was alive, he was eating. Okay, but he was alive, more alive than we understand how he was alive. He could show up when the doors were all closed and no door opened and he was in the middle of the room. And I used to love this part when I was a kid growing up. Jesus walked through doors and walls. Yay! But I never thought so much of that he ate with them. He shared a meal. The best communication time ever, isn't it? He told them some news, though. And it wasn't the kind of news that you like to hear either. He commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem. Basically, he told them to wait. You pick up the phone, you get through to a real person, and you're so excited, and then that real person sounds like they're a robot, and they say, wait. <laughs> you go, oh, I thought I got somewhere. We don't like waiting. But we need to wait, and the disciples were told to wait. But they were told in the same sentence what they're waiting for. Because God was going to give them the gift he had promised. And Jesus promised the disciples that they would receive power to witness after they received the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So they were going to, had to wait, and they had to wait for this to happen. They had been waiting for a lot of things, and we'll find out what, uh, what they were waiting for in a minute when we read that, the line about them asking Jesus more and more, trying to get the, some more questions out of him about the kingdom and stuff. But right now, he, they were told to wait for power. They had witnessed power. They had experienced power. There's stories of, of the disciples going off at two by two and healing people and when Jesus was alive and then coming back and reporting to Jesus. Sometimes it didn't work well and other times it did. They had seen Jesus and seen his power and Jesus said, you're going to get it. You're going to get that power. But wait. They were to wait. They would receive power to witness after they received the Holy Spirit. There's a progression here. There's three things. They would receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would give them power. And then they would witness with extraordinary results. Sometimes the order of things isn't all that important. You people who cook, uh, sometimes the order isn't important, and sometimes it is. If you put the ingredients into a cold pan, or, uh, it just doesn't work. It's got to be a hot pan, so you've got to heat the pan before you put the ingredients in. Or you mix it. Never mind, I'm not going to go into all that. I, I, I've done it when you, if you put the liquid in first and you put, never mind, it, there's an order to things, right Larry? That's right. Okay, there's an order to this. If they were to wait for the, to receive the Holy Spirit. And that just throws us all off, because that kind of language we don't understand so much what it means. But we had to receive the Holy Spirit. They were to receive the Holy Spirit. They kind of knew what it meant. Jesus had been telling them. And then it would be the Holy Spirit that would give them power. And then they would witness. Sometimes we try to reverse the order of things. And in, in this situation, we try to witness in our own power and authority. Because you heard a real good preacher, or you were at Bible camp once, and, and you saw somebody, uh, something happened in your life, and you get all excited about it, so you tell the story, and you don't even ask God to help you and make it his story. Not such a bad thing, because you're witnessing, eh? But if you're doing, trying to do it in your own power, it won't work. So the order is important. Jesus says, as I told you before, he would give them the promised friend, advocate. Comfort her. Waiting is hard. Waiting is hard for those who are powerless. Because they, well, and waiting is hard for those that are all pumped up too, that seem to think that they got all the power. They're ready to go now. Sometimes waiting is harder for the people that are really good at things. Because they want to get at it. And waiting is hard, especially hard for those who are fearful. What's going to happen next? Well, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, he gave the Holy Spirit to the disciples, he gave him the Holy Spirit to his disciples for all time. That means us. If you're waiting around and saying, well, I don't feel like I have the Holy Spirit. The guys down at the other churches in town that, uh, that have some manifestations or some things about the Holy Spirit, maybe they got the Holy Spirit, but not me. Well, folks, that's not what the Bible teaches. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit. Then you're ready to let him give you the power, and then you're ready to speak his name, in his name, in Jesus' name, and tell others. So what would you look like if you understood clearer that you are filled with the Holy Spirit? That is not your power. If because you know Jesus, because you're, you've confessed your sins, you let Jesus into your life, you have the Holy Spirit. But have you thought about what you, how you need to look because you have that power? What would you do? Well, in our story, the disciples kept... They, really enjoying their time. Maybe they hadn't enjoyed their time so much when they were walking around Galilee and he told them that at night where we're going to go tomorrow and they go, oh, that's a long way. I mean, I don't know what they were, how they really reacted, but I put myself in there and, and another long walk. Oh, I don't believe it. Anyway, but now they're, they're really enjoying Jesus. They're asking him questions. 
It's as if they knew that time was coming short. After all, Jesus had died and he'd come back. They weren't sure what was next. We know that Jesus was only there for 40 days. But when they were with Jesus, now he was a different Jesus and his words were more powerful and the life was going to be more exciting and all their waiting was over because they had Jesus and he had defeated death. And so they had all these questions. They kept asking him, Luke writes. They kept asking him. There was so much teaching and showing, God, Jesus was showing the kingdom of God and they kept asking him. What did they keep asking him? Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom of David? Jesus had died on the cross for all mankind, defeated the sa Satan for all time. And, all, and, and these disciples, having dinner with him, they're still thinking about their little kingdom. They're thinking about what's outside the door. They're thinking about their Jewishness when their King David was <coughs> real powerful and defeated nations around him. They wanted their kingdom back. They wanted the Roman soldiers out of town. <laughs> That's what they kept asking. The great theologian John Calvin wrote about this portion. He said, the question had as many errors in it as it did words. That's a nice way of saying it was a really dumb question. All right, we can handle the dumb thing part, that it missed the point. Restore your kingdom, free Israel, missing the point altogether. We hear the story over and over. We hear the story of love and forgiveness, trust, and we still want to be in control. We want the story to be about our little piece of the world. That's what the disciples were doing. We don't, we don't pick on them or blame them and call them dumb or anything, but they were so focused and they missed the point of what Jesus had done for the whole world. And we really don't want to pick on them because we do the same thing. When we hear the story, we have the blessings of feeling forgiven, of being forgiven, not just feeling it, of a right relationship with God through Jesus. And what do we do with it? We start figuring out how we can earn more money through that, or how we can have more friends than somebody else, or we, can, we make it about us. We want to be in control. That's what kind of the disciples we don't want to analyze it or second guess them, but some of them had already had fights with one another about who was going to be first in the kingdom. Remember the story? They even got their mother to ask Jesus about it. That, that was disgusting. But they did that, and they're still messing this up. But we are too when we try to keep control. Back in, Luke had reported this in, in Luke 24, 45. He said, Then Jesus opened their minds. It's not that as if the disciples hadn't been told. Back in the Gospel of Luke, in, 20, in chapter 24, 45, then Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He just didn't teach them. He opened their minds, too, so they didn't have an excuse. Then he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day. It was also written that his, this message would be proclaimed in the authority of Jesus' name, of his name, into all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. The message that Jesus said back in Luke, he said, there is forgiveness of sins for all who will, re will repent. You are witnesses of these things. He told them back before he died. Now yeah, they must have missed it a little bit. But they, they were going to be witnesses to all things. In the Greek the word witness is the same word for martyr. And we can work that through a little bit, but it won't this morning. It's the same word. So witnessing is not just showing what we can do for God. It's showing and telling others what God has done for us. 
So if you're feeling that you don't know the story well enough, you don't know enough of the Bible before you can tell somebody, no, don't worry about that. You go over in your own heart and mind what God has done for you. That's what's interesting to other people anyway. They just don't want another book to read. They want you to tell them what God has done for you. If you haven't got words for that, work on it. Go over that. Use a pen and a paper if you have to, or your computer. Put on the top of the page, what has God done for me? Write it down. Go over it. Then you'll know what you have to get to tell somebody when they say, what's this about going to church? What is, what's this about Muslims and, 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 and Christians and all any problem in the world, it can come down. They want, they're interested in to know why you have that point of view, and you can tell them because God has forgiven you through Jesus Christ. Because you wrote it down on your list. When you tell others about Christ, rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you can be a powerful witness. But do your homework, too. Know what God has done for you. Then in verse 8, it describes Jesus' words by saying that they... They need to go out. And he says that they need to go out with the gospel and it would spread geographically from Jerusalem, Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to all the other parts of the world. Well, looking at that verse, we need to realize that it probably was not good news to many people in that room. Because in the room, where, where, wherever they were, some of them would have been very, very Jewish disciples. Which means that when they heard that it was going to start, it was going to begin with devout Jews in Jerusalem, they thought of who are the devout Jews in Jerusalem? They're the ones that just crucified Jesus. The bad guys. We've got to wait around and start telling them first. They hate Jesus. And then Judea. For us, it's just, it's just a geographical thing, you know? We got the circles, Jerusalem, Judea, and then it has no, no emotion for us, because we don't even know who lives in those places. But Judea, that's where people who weren't Jews lived. And Jewish people, those disciples, were brought up to believe that only God loved only them, not other people. So the gospel was going to go to the... Jesus hating Jews in Jerusalem. And then it was going to go to the Gentiles in Judea and Samaria. They were even worse. They were saying in their culture it was better to be born a dog than a Samaritan, a non-Jew. It was also better to be born a dog than a woman, but that's a different story. And finally, they, the Gentiles would be offered this good news. The gospel has not reached its final destination yet. How do we know that? The gospel hasn't reached its final destination if someone in your family, your workplace, your school, your community hasn't heard about this forgiveness of Jesus Christ. How are you contributing to that ever-expanding testimony of God's mercy and grace? Well, this passage of Scripture also includes uh, verses 9 to 11, and, and that's uh, when I went to school one time, they, one of the requirements to get out of that school with a piece of paper that they promised you at the beginning and you paid your money for was that you had to write a, a thesis, they called it, kind of like a little book. Okay, more than a little, but you had to write this book. And, and I got directions and, and, and from somebody that said, oh, this will be a good one. So I chose the Ascension in Luke and Acts. And don't worry, I never even pulled it off the shelf in preparation for the sermon. But I have looked at it before. But the ascension, Jesus, as it's described here, ends his time on earth. We can say that it's a great finish. But there was nobody blowing trumpets. There was no parade. There was nothing exciting about it. They were out on the hillside. Disciples have been enjoying Jesus in new ways in this last while. And it seems like all of a sudden, Jesus is talking to them, and then a cloud came by, and he wasn't there anymore. 
And remember these fishermen? They were kind of verbal, but Luke probably was a doctor and he didn't have time or patience probably to write down the things that those fishermen said when the cloud went away and Jesus wasn't there. And I'm sure they didn't have potty mouths or anything like that, but there, there's lots of exclamations in every culture that make it clear that they were amazed and, what, where did he go? What's up with this? And all the other things that you can fit in with people who are really surprised. Ah, we don't need to be surprised that Luke didn't put it in here, but they stood amazed, it says. They stood staring. Why not? They, they had been talking to Jesus and he wasn't there anymore. When something amazing happens to you, when you're so shocked, and, and, and the nice shock, eh? The, the kind of nice shock that you suddenly realize what, that this was God that did that. It was a God thing. And it happened to you. And you, you're so shocked about it, and you're, you don't know. Well, the disciples weren't left alone. <coughs> they were given help. Two messengers from God. And I believe that God gives you help. Just be patient. He doesn't leave you. He brings a Bible verse to you or somebody else inter interacts with you. <coughs> so they said, the, the two men, they were angels, said, what are you standing around staring about? They were staring in the sky. Jesus is coming back. That's what they said. You need to be busy. Paul wrote these, these words in 1 Thessalonians in his letter to them. I don't think, friends, that I need to deal with the question of when all this is going to happen, Jesus coming back. You know as well as I that the day the, of the Master's coming can't be posted on our calendars. We won't call ahead. He won't call ahead and make an appointment any more than a burglar would. About the time everybody's walking around complacently congratulating each other, we sure made it. How can it? How can, now we can take it easy because we've made it. Suddenly everything will fall apart. It's going, it's going to come as quickly and inescapably as birth pangs to a pregnant woman. The angel said, well, Jesus had answered when they, to the disciples, When's this going to happen? He said, no man knows. That's, that's God's business. And now the angels were saying the same thing. He's coming back. But don't stand around. You won't hurry up. Okay, somebody even made a saying about watching water boil, eh? You can't speed up the water boiling by watching the fire. You can't get Jesus to come back more by just standing and looking in the sky and saying, I'm going to learn more Bible verses. I'm going to go to church more often. He wants us to get out and be busy in telling others. That's what we need to be doing. So, Jesus loves me, this I know. So the Bible tells me so. The gift of the Holy Spirit makes us open to understand and obey the Bible. Don't be confused that the Holy Spirit is going to give you supernatural powers. They will be in some ways to talk about spiritual things. But we need to do our homework. We need to let... The, and if you think it's not supernatural to actually want to read your Bible, just do an interview or two from the people that are in this room how easy it is for them to do their Bible devotions. Go ahead and try that sometime. It's a miracle when you actually get down to spending time in God's Word. And it's a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to do it, otherwise you will be in control and you won't. So we need to know what the Bible teaches. The disciples did get it, by the way. That's why we're here now, 2,000 years later. They heard the angels question about why are they staring at the sky. The waiting is over. Get busy, they said. Acknowledge God's love and power. Make plans to live victoriously. That's what the disciples were told, and that's what you need to hear, I need to hear this morning. We need to get busy. Luke records in 2452. He says, so they worshipped him. Not the angels. They worshipped the Jesus that wasn't there. 
Jesus isn't in this room physically like he's wearing the sandals and the robe that he was wearing 2,000 years ago. He's not here that way. He wasn't there with them after the cloud disappeared, but they worshipped him. We worship him when we gather together. We worship him when we declare his name throughout the week. They worshipped him and they returned to Jerusalem filled with joy. They didn't see this as a bad thing at all. Remember, Jesus had opened their hearts and their minds. Let's get at it. Let's do it with joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the excitement that you provide for us about knowing what's going on around us in a mixed up, hurtful world. Lord, let us sense the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Keep us from staring up into the sky and wasting time. Help us to turn our focus onto those around us that you've given us to tell the story. Empower us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.